The Prince by Niccolo Machiavelli Translated by W. K. Marriott Chapters 23, 24, 25, and 26 Chapter 23 How Flatterers Should Be Avoided I do not wish to leave out an important branch of this subject, for it is a danger from which princes are with difficulty preserved, unless they are very careful and discriminating. It is that of flatterers, of whom courts are full, because men are so self-complacent in their own affairs, and in a way so deceived in them, that they are preserved with difficulty from this pest, and if they wish to defend themselves, they run the danger of falling into contempt, because there is no other way of guarding oneself from flatterers except letting men understand that to tell you the truth does not offend you. But when every one may tell you the truth, respect for you abates. Therefore, a wise prince ought to hold a third course by choosing the wise men in his state, and giving to them only the liberty of speaking the truth to him, and then only of the things of which he inquires and of none others. But he ought to question them upon everything, and listen to their opinions, and afterwards form his own conclusions. With these counsellors, separately and collectively, he ought to carry himself in such a way that each of them should know that, the more freely he shall speak, the more he shall be preferred. Outside of these, he should listen to no one, pursue the thing resolved on, and be steadfast in his resolutions. He who does otherwise is either overthrown by flatterers, or is so often changed by varying opinions that he falls into contempt. I wish, on this subject, to adduce a modern example. Fra Luca, the man of affairs to Maximilian, the present emperor, speaking of his majesty, said, He consulted with no one, yet never got his own way in anything. This arose because of his following a practice the opposite to the above. For the emperor is a secretive man. He does not communicate his designs to anyone, nor does he receive opinions on them. But, as in carrying them into effect they become revealed and known, they are at once obstructed by those men whom he has around him and he, being pliant, is diverted from them. Hence, it follows that those things he does one day, he undoes the next, and no one ever understands what he wishes or intends to do, and no one can rely on his resolutions. Begin Note Maximilian I, born in 1459, died in 1519, Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. He married, first, Mary, daughter of Charles the Bold, after her death, Bianca Sforza, and thus became involved in Italian politics. End note. A prince, therefore, ought always to take counsel, but only when he wishes, and not when others wish. He ought rather to discourage every one from offering advice unless he asks it. But, however, he ought to be a constant inquirer, and afterwards a patient listener, concerning the things of which he inquired. Also, on learning that any one, on any consideration, has not told him the truth, he should let his anger be felt. And if there are some who think that a prince who conveys an impression of his wisdom is not so through his own ability, but through the good advisers that he has around him, beyond doubt, they are deceived, 
because this is an axiom which never fails, that a prince who is not wise himself will never take good advice, unless by chance he has yielded his affairs entirely to one person who happens to be a very prudent man. In this case, indeed, he may be well governed, but it would not be for long because such a governor would in a short time take away his state from him. But, if a prince who is not inexperienced should take counsel from more than one, he will never get united counsels, nor will he know how to unite them. Each of the counsellors will think of his own interests, and the prince will not know how to control them or to see through them and they are not to found otherwise, because men will always prove untrue to you, unless they are kept honest by constraint. Therefore, it must be inferred that good counsels, whensoever they come, are born of the wisdom of the prince, and not the wisdom of the prince from good counsels. Chapter 24 why the princes of Italy have lost their states. The previous suggestions, carefully observed, will enable a new prince to appear well established, and render him at once more secure and fixed in the state than if he had been long seated there. For the actions of a new prince are more narrowly observed than those of a hereditary one and when they are seen to be able to gain more men and bind far tighter than ancient blood, because men are more attracted by the present than the past, and when they find the present good, they enjoy it and seek no further. They also make the most defense of a prince if he fails them not in other things. Thus, it will be a double glory for him to have established a new principality and adorned and strengthened it with good laws, good arms, good allies, and with a good example. So it will be a double disgrace to him who, born a prince, shall lose his state by want of wisdom. And if those seigneurs are considered who have lost their states in Italy in our times, such as the king of Naples, the duke of Milan, and others, there will be found in them, firstly, one common defect in regard to arms, from the causes which have been discussed at length in the next place. Some one of them will be seen either to have had the people hostile, or, if he has had the people friendly, he has not known how to secure the nobles. In the absence of these defects, states that have power enough to keep an army in the field cannot be lost. Philip of Macedon, not the father of Alexander the Great, but he who was conquered by Titus Quintinius, had not much territory compared to the greatness of the Romans and of Greece who attacked him. Yet, being a warlike man who knew how to attract the people and secure the nobles, he sustained the war against his enemies for many years, and if in the end he lost the dominion of some cities, nevertheless he retained the kingdom. Therefore, do not let our princes accuse fortune for the loss of their principalities after so many years' possession, but rather their own sloth because in quiet times they never thought there could be a change. It is a common defect in men not to take any provision in the calm against the tempest. And when afterwards the bad times came, they thought of flight and not of defending themselves, and they hoped that the people, disgusted with the insolence of the conquerors, would recall them. This course, when others fail, may be good but it is very bad to have neglected all the other expedients for that, since you would never wish to fall because you trusted to be able to find someone later on to restore you. This again either does not happen, or if it does, it will not be for your security, because that deliverance is of no avail which does not depend upon yourself. 
those only are reliable, certain, and durable, that depend on yourself and your valour. CHAPTER Twenty Five. What fortune can effect in human affairs, and how to withstand her. It is not unknown to me how many men have had, and still have, the opinion that the affairs of the world are in such wise governed by fortune and by God that men with their wisdom cannot direct them and that no one can even help them. And because of this, they would have us believe that it is not necessary to labor much in affairs, but to let chance govern them. This opinion has been more credited in our times because of the great changes in affairs which have been seen, and may still be seen every day beyond all human conjecture. Sometimes pondering this, I am in some degree inclined to their opinion, nevertheless, not to extinguish our free will, I hold it to be true that fortune is the arbiter of one half of our actions, but that she still leaves us to direct the other half, or perhaps a little less. Begin note. Frederick the Great was accustomed to say, The older one gets the more convinced one becomes that His Majesty King Chance does three-quarters of the business of this miserable universe. From Sorel's Eastern Question End note I compare her to one of those raging rivers, which, when in flood, overflows the plains, sweeping away trees and buildings, Bearing away the soil from place to place, everything flies before it, all yield to its violence, without being able in any way to withstand it. And yet, though its nature be such, it does not follow, therefore, that men, when the weather becomes fair, shall not make provision, both with defences and barriers, in such a manner that, rising again, the waters may pass away by canal, and their force be neither so unrestrained nor so dangerous. So it happens with fortune, who shows her power where valour has not prepared to resist her, and thither she turns her forces, where she knows that barriers and defences have not been raised to constrain her. And if you will consider Italy, which is the seat of these changes, and which has been given to them their impulse, you will see it to be an open country without barriers and without any defence. For if it had been defended by proper valour, as are Germany, Spain, and France, either this invasion would not have made that great changes it has made, or it would not have come at all. And this I consider enough to say, concerning resistance to fortune in general. But, confining myself more to the particular, I say that a prince may be seen happy today and ruined tomorrow without having shown any change of disposition or character. This, I believe, arises firstly from causes that have already been discussed at length, namely, that the prince who relies entirely on fortune is lost when it changes. I believe also that he will succeed who directs his actions according to the spirit of the times, and that he whose actions do not accord with the times will not be successful, because men are seen in affairs that lead to the end which every man has before him, namely glory and riches, to get there by various methods one with caution, another with haste, one with force, another by skill, one by patience, another by its opposite, and each one succeeds in reaching the goal by a different method. One can also see of two cautious men the one attain his end, the other fail, and similarly two men of different observances are also equally successful, the one being cautious, the other impetuous. All this arises from nothing else than whether or not they conform in their methods to the spirit of the times. This follows from what I have said. 
that two men working differently bring about the same effect, and of two working similarly, one attains his object and the other does not. Changes in a state also issue from this, for if, to one who governs himself with caution and patience, time and affairs converge in such a way that his administration is successful, his fortune is made. But if time and affairs change, he is ruined if he does not change his course of action. But a man is not often found sufficiently circumspect to know how to accommodate himself to the change, both because he cannot deviate from what nature inclines him to do, but also because, having always prospered by acting in one way, he cannot be persuaded that it is well to leave it, and therefore the cautious man, when it is time to turn adventurous, does not know how to do it, Hence he is ruined. But had he changed his conduct with the times, fortune would not have changed. Pope Julius the Second went to work impetuously in all his affairs, and found times and circumstances conformed so well to that line of action that he always met with success. Consider his first enterprise against Bologna. Messer Giovanni Bentvioli being still alive, the Venetians were not agreeable to it, nor was the king of Spain, and he had the enterprise still under his discussion with the king of France. Nevertheless, he personally entered upon the expedition with his accustomed boldness and energy, a move which made Spain and the Venetians stand irresolute and passive. The latter from fear the former from desire to recover the kingdom of Naples, and on the other hand he drew after him the king of France, because that king, having observed the movement and desiring to make the Pope his friend, so as to humble the Venetians, found it impossible to refuse him. Therefore Julius, with his impetuous action, accomplished what no other pontiff with simple human wisdom could have done, for if he had waited in Rome, until he could get away, with his plans arranged and everything fixed, as any other pontiff would have done, he would never have succeeded, because the king of France would have made a thousand excuses, and others would have raised a thousand fears. I will leave his other actions alone, as they were all alike, and they all succeeded, for the shortness of his life did not let him experience the contrary. But if circumstances had arisen which required him to go cautiously, his ruin would have followed, because he would never have deviated from those ways to which nature inclined him. I conclude, therefore, that fortune being changeful and mankind steadfast in their ways, so long as the two are in agreement, Man is successful, but unsuccessful when they fall out. For my part, I consider that it is better to be adventurous than cautious, because fortune is a woman, and if you wish to keep her under, it is necessary to beat her and ill-use her. And it is seen that she allows herself to be mastered by the adventurous rather than those who go to work more coldly. She is, therefore, always womanlike a lover of young men, because they are less cautious, more violent, and with more audacity command her. Chapter 26 An Exhortation to Liberate Italy from the Barbarians Having carefully considered the subject of the above discourses, and wondering within myself whether the present times were propitious to a new prince, and whether there were elements that would give an opportunity to a wise and virtuous one to introduce a new order of things, which would do honor to him and good to the people of his country, it appears to me that so many things concur to favor a new prince that I never knew a time more fit than the present. And if, as I have said, 
it was necessary that the people of Israel should be captives so as to make manifest the ability of Moses, that the Persians should be oppressed by Medes so as to discover the greatness of the soul of Cyrus, and that the Athenians should be dispersed to illustrate the capabilities of Theseus, then at the present time, in order to discover the virtue of an Italian spirit, it is necessary that Italy should be reduced to the extremity that she is now in, that she should be more enslaved than the Hebrews, more oppressed than the Persians, more scattered than the Athenians, without head, without order, beaten, despoiled, torn, overrun, and to have endured every kind of desolation. Although, lately, some spark may have been shown by one, which made us think he was ordained by God for his redemption. Nevertheless, it was afterwards seen in the height of his career that fortune rejected him, so that Italy, left as without life, waits for him who shall yet heal her wounds, and put an end to the ravaging and the plundering of Lombardy, to the swindling and taxing of the kingdom and of Tuscany, and cleanse those sores that for long have festered. It is seen how she entreats God to send someone who shall deliver her from these wrongs and barbarous insolences. It is seen also that she is ready and willing to follow a banner if only someone will raise it. Nor is there to be seen at present one in whom she can place more hope than in your illustrious house, with its valour and fortune favoured by God and by the church, of which it is now chief, and which could be made the head of this redemption. This will not be difficult if you will recall to yourself the actions and lives of the men I have named. And although they were great and wonderful men, yet they were men and each of them had no more opportunity than the present offers, for their enterprises were neither more just nor easier than this, nor was God more their friend than he is yours. Begin note. Giulano de' Medici. He had just been created a cardinal by Leo X. In 1523, Giuliano was elected Pope, who took the title of Clement the Seventh. note. With us there is great justice, because that war is just, which is necessary, and arms are hollowed, when there is no other hope but in them. Here there is the greatest willingness, and where the willingness is great, the difficulties cannot be great, if you will only follow those men to whom I have directed your attention. Further than this, how extraordinarily the ways of God have been manifested up beyond example. The sea is divided, a cloud has led the way, the rock has poured forth water, it has rained manna. Everything has contributed to your greatness. You ought to do the rest. God is not willing to do everything, and thus take away our free will and that share of glory which belongs to us. And it is not to be wondered at all, none of the above-mentioned Italians have been able to accomplish all that is expected from your illustrious house. And if in so many revolutions in Italy, and in so many campaigns, it has always appeared as if military virtue were exhausted, this has happened because the old order of things was not good, and none of us has known how to find a new one. And nothing honors man more than to establish new laws and new ordinances when he himself has newly risen. Such things when they are well-founded and dignified, will make him revered and admired. And in Italy, there are not wanting opportunities to bring such use into every form. 
Here there is great valor in the limbs whilst it fails in the head. Look attentively at the duels and at the hand-to-hand -hand combats, how superior the Italians are in strength, dexterity, and subtlety. But when it comes to armies, they do not bear comparison, and this brings entirely from the inefficiency of the leaders, since those who are capable are not obedient, and each one seems to himself to know there having never been any one so distinguished above the rest, either by valor or fortune, that others would yield to him. Hence it is that for so long a time, and during so much fighting in the past twenty years, whenever there has been an army wholly Italian, it has always given a poor account of itself. The first witness to this is Il Taro, afterwards Alessandria, uh, Capua, Genoa, Velia, Bologna, Mestri. Begin note. The Battles of Il Toro, 1495, Alessandria, 1499, Capua, 1501, Genoa, 1507, Velia, 1509, Bologna, 1511, Maestri, 1513. End note. If, therefore, your illustrious house wishes to follow these remarkable men who have redeemed their country, it is necessary before all things as a true foundation for every enterprise to be provided with your own forces, because there can be no more faithful, truer, or better soldiers. And although singly they are good, altogether they will be much better when they find themselves commanded by their prince, honored by him, and maintained at his expense. Therefore it is necessary to be prepared with such arms, so that you can be defended against foreigners by Italian valor. And although Swiss and Spanish infantry may be considered very formidable, nevertheless there is a defect in both, by reason of which a third order would not only be able to oppose them, but might be relied upon to overthrow them, for the Spaniards cannot resist cavalry, and the Switzers are afraid of infantry whenever they encounter them in close combat. Owing to this, as has been and may be seen, the Spaniards are unable to resist French cavalry, and the Switzers are overthrown by Spanish infantry. And although a complete proof of this latter cannot be shown, Nevertheless, there has been some evidence of it at the Battle of Ravenna, when the Spanish infantry was confronted by German battalions, who followed the same tactics as the Swiss, when the Spaniards, by agility and body, and with the aid of their shields, got in under the pikes of the Germans and stood out of danger, able to attack while the Germans stood helpless, and, if the cavalry had not dashed up, all would have been over with them. It is possible, therefore, knowing the defects of these inventories, to invent a new one, which will resist cavalry and not be afraid of infantry. This need not create a new order of arms, but a variation upon the old. And these are the kind of improvements which confer reputation and power upon a new prince. This opportunity, therefore, ought not to be allowed to pass for letting Italy at last see her liberator appear. Nor can one express the love with which he would have received in all those provinces, which would have suffered so much from these foreign scourings. With what thirst for revenge, with what stubborn faith, with what devotion, with what tears, what door would be closed to him? Who would refuse obedience to him? Who would envy, would hinder him? What Italian would refuse to him to homage? To all of us, this barbarous dominion stinks. Let, therefore, your illustrious house take up this charge with that courage, and hope 
with which all just enterprises are taken, such that under its standard our native country may be ennobled, and under the auspices may be verified that saying of Petrarch, Virtù contro al furore, prenderà l'arme, e figlia al combatter corto, che l'antico valore negli italici cuor non ha ancor morto. Virtue against fury shall advance the fight, and it, in the combat, soon shall put to flight. For the old Roman valor is not dead, nor in the Italians' breasts extinguished. Edward Dockery, 1640 End of chapters 23, 24, 25, and 26 As read by John Gonzales